سيئات أعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له نحمده حمدا كثيرا ونسبح بحمده بكرة وأصيلا وأصلي وأسلم على خير خلقه وخاتم رسله محمد بن عبد الله أرسله ربه بالهدى ودين الحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا فهدى به بعد الضلال وبصر به بعد العمى نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجزيه عنا خير ما يجازي به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين Last time a very dear brother approached me and he said you're talking about the description for a great Muslim generation we need to know how how do we go about raising a great Muslim generation which is the mission of every Muslim who lives in this country. It is in fact the mission of every Muslim everywhere. We need a generation that is different from our own. And today inshallah I'm going to start on this direction which is to talk about how do we raise a great Muslim generation. You know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifts you with a child, the child becomes your trust and your gift and yes, your test. A child is a gift and a test and a trust. As a trust, you must keep your child from every harmful thing. Now, everyone's head is running around electric, you know, open outlets or hot stoves or dangerous material things. But that's not the limit of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Protect yourselves and your children and your family from fire. This is not just a stove or electric, electric fire. It's to protect each other and ourselves, our families from hellfire. Whatever this takes, it is the primary task of the Muslim. Especially, we're talking about Muslim parents. Your primary task is not to feed them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us on the tongue of Prophet Ibrahim, when he spoke about Allah, he says, وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينِي Allah is the one who feeds me. Allah is the one who provides me with the drink, the water that I need for my life. But unfortunately, we parents are more worried about feeding the stomach than feeding the spirit. And the Quran is talking about feeding both. When it comes to the stomach, Allah is a provider. But we parents, unfortunately, focus on our role as if we are the providers. And we forget that it is Allah. Inna Allah huwa razzaqu dhul quwwatil mateen. Allah is the ultimate provider. Huwa alladhi yunazzilu lakum min as-samai rizqa. Wa ma yatadhakkaru illa man yunib. Allah is the one who provides us from heaven. Wa fi as-samai rizqukum. Indeed, it is in heaven where your provision really is. So we need not only to practice this understanding, but we also need to teach our children that they are not the providers for their children. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ وَنَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ So on both sides, Allah is a razzaq so let us not focus or limit rather our role as to bringing food and money or milk and eggs home we need to bring guidance this is what will save our children 
and us from hellfire. So the primary mission that we should focus on as parents is how do we save our children from hellfire and how primarily to even save ourselves. If this is the focus, then it follows that every parent should learn what it is that if I do, I save myself from hellfire. And if I inculcate in my children, if I instill in my children, it will help them protect themselves from hellfire. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, اتقوا النار ولو بشق تمره Protect yourself from hellfire, even if it is half a piece of date. Just half. Half a date will save you from hellfire. What is the focus here? The focus here is on charity. The focus on giving. The focus on providing to others half of a date that is the only one you have, divide it into two and give someone else who doesn't have it. In the lengthy hadith, the Prophet وسلم, says, <coughs> من كان عنده فضل مال فليعد به على من لا مال له He who has extra money or resources or wealth, let him give that to the one who doesn't have it. من كان عنده فضل زاد He who has extra food فليعد به على من لا زاد له Let him take it to the one who doesn't have it. من كان عنده فضل ظهر which is an extra ride you have an empty seat in your car take someone to where they want to go if you can you have an extra car give it to someone who doesn't have one who needs one so giving and giving and giving the narrator of the hadith the sahabi Abu Sa'id al-Khudri says and the Prophet وسلم, kept counting and citing different types of things that we should be giving until we understood fully that no one has any right in anything extra, which means no one has a right in anything that is more than his basic needs. This is Islam. This is Islam. So when our children look at us hoarding beyond our needs that many of us don't have a place to put things in their home they don't have a place in the refrigerator to pack it it's overpacked and we know that some of us don't have what we have so the hadith is saying look at those who need and give them what allah has run through your hand allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us either directly or indirectly. Directly by you working, you making your living, and this is the foundation, this is the principle. The Prophet وسلم, says, ما أكل أحد طعاما قط خيرا من أن يأكل من عمل يده Nobody ate any better food than what he earns with his own hands. So working is a value. Working, making wealth, earning your own living is a value in and of itself. But at the same time, some people will work, but they will not make enough. You will look at them and you think they are well off, but maybe they are not. You see, a sister who has been divorced and she is left with three or five kids. She may have a car. She may be even working. But we know that women in this society do not make, unfortunately, as much as men in the same position with the same qualifications. We need to ask, we need to check. Because she may have the rent, but not the food. She may have the food, but not the medicine. She may have medicine of the counter, but she may not have insurance to buy prescribed medicine. So we need to go beyond the classic definition of a needy person. She is needy because her basic needs are not met. So we need to look at those individuals, those families around us, and to let our children 
take from their own pocket money and donate. If you train your kids when they come to the masjid to put a couple of dollars or five dollars in the box, they get used to it. Something they get to grow up with and it becomes part of their habit. When we try to get our children to obey us and to be loyal to us and to be kind to us, we forget that their relationship with Allah is what will bring them to your obedience and to listen to your guidance. So before your child rebels against you, he has been rebelling against Allah and you let it go because you don't want to create a problem with your son or daughter. And I'm talking about young children. I'm not talking about, you know, teenage rebellion or anything like that. I'm talking about young children. If you do not teach your child to pray by the age of seven and to be regular in prayer by the age of 10, don't try to catch him when he is 18. It just doesn't make sense. I'm not saying let him go, but don't start with practice. Start with teaching. Start with conviction. Because by that time, by the age of 17 and 18, unless they are convinced, they wouldn't obey, they wouldn't listen. So if you let them fester in rebellious and disobedient positions for 18 years, how do you want to make a fight over missing a prayer when he's never prayed? So please, we have to be careful what do we teach our children? And who is the target? Who is our target? Our target when we discipline our children is the shaitan, not your son. Your target is to separate your son from the shaitan. You want the shaitan out of his life. So the only way is to win the child over to your side. To win him over, you have to win him first to the side of Allah. When they submit to him, they will listen to you. If they don't submit to him, then you need to continue to work until they submit to Allah. It will be very difficult for them to listen to you or give you the respect and the kind treatment that you deserve as a parent. So the first step is what the Prophet وسلم, says. أَدِّبُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ عَلَى حُبِّ اللَّهِ Raise your kids on the love of Allah. وَعَلَى حُبِّ نَبِيِّكُمْ And to love the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. صلى الله عليه وسلم. والثالثة وَعَلَى تِلَاوَةِ الْقُرْآنِ I want you to pay attention. على تلاوة القرآن. He didn't say حفظ. He said تلاوة. That, that is not to say that hifz is bad or hifz is undesirable. It is very desirable. If your child can memorize, keep training them until they memorize at least what they need to pray with and what they need to understand, the basics of their faith. But the Prophet's instruction is get them used on regular basis to read and recite the Quran in the proper way. Because the Quran will tell him more than whatever you want to tell them. Whatever you think is good guidance, good advice, good direction, just deliver them to the Qur'an and the Qur'an will deliver them to you in commitment and obedience. So we need to know where to start. And the Prophet وسلم, is the one who told us, Teach your children Prayer at the age of seven. They must learn how to pray. Some of us bring their kids to the masjid when they are two, three, and four. Right? Whether they are quiet and disciplined or they make noise or play, they bring them. But by the age of seven, they are too busy with the school. So they are not going to come to the masjid. But they will come maybe in Ramadan, maybe in the Eid. But their relationship with the masjid will be so sporadic that it is not the center of their life. So every creature of Allah has a nest, a place that they call home, the center around which their life revolves. We Muslims, our center 
is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the generation of the Sahaba. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with all of them. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes his light. Allah nuru samawati wal ard. مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور والله بكل شيء عليم Where is this? يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء والله بكل شيء عليم. So here is Allah describing the light of this universe as something in his house where في بيوت أذن الله أن ترفع in houses that Allah has commanded and ordered be raised up. يسبح له فيها in those houses, people who praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Men who are not distracted by business or trade or anything else from the remembrance of Allah. So part of our raising of our children is to raise them and get them used to the masjid. The rules of the masjid, the spirit in the masjid, the way the masjid works, and their role and responsibility towards the masjid. They are, after all, going to be the leaders of this place. Just you blink twice, they will be here, and you will be gone. So we have to raise our children in the masjid. If you cannot bring them all the prayers, which is understandable, bring them as many times as you make possible for them to come. They don't drive, so you have to be the chauffeur. You have to be the driver. And you have to give them the drive to want to come to the masjid. And when they come to the masjid, make sure that they sit and listen. They come here to pray, not just to play. So we have to have a place that they can call the center. The legacy you leave for your children, when you are gone, and they continue to say, my dad used to bring me to the masjid when I was young. And he used to sit with me in the class of the Quran. I used to learn the Quran with my dad. This is a memory that you should never ever deprive your child of. This is how we raise them as Muslims, basically. But they need to go beyond the entry point to Islam. They need to target, we need to target making them men, which means manly in their choices. Not to continue to be children after the age of 12, 13, 14, 15, 18, 20, 22, 23. This is too long of a childhood. <laughs> Usama ibn Zayd was between 16 and 17 when he was assigned the leadership of the army of the Muslims to fight against the apostates who rebelled against the Muslim community. So we have to be careful. Our children will reach 16 and think of themselves as children. Right? So we have to be careful. The context in which we put our children influences the scope of their attention and the definition of what is important, what is a priority in their life. So if we only wake our children for the school, which means one hour or more after Fajr and after sunrise, we are teaching them that Fajr prayer is unimportant. What's important is the school. When they have an exam, we make them sit until they finish the study. 
That's if we could hold them down to do that. But when it is Aisha that is becoming late, I get the questions. Can I get my son to pray Aisha with Maghrib because he wants to go to bed so that he can wake up for the school? So now we are even teaching our children to treat prayer recklessly. That it is very, very unimportant in their life. It is very insignificant. And instead of, look at the opposite. Look at the opposite. If you use to get your child to the masjid when they are young, and you train them at home before you bring them to the masjid, so that when they come, they are focused on prayer as they are at home. And the measure I always give parents is, if your child is able to stand with you in prayer, and is disciplined and patient for one week, then he is ready to come and stand in line and be patient and disciplined in the masjid. But not before that. So until your child stops running around in the prayer and playing and pushing and shoving in the prayer, when they are in that stage, keep them home and keep teaching them to pray with you. When you notice they are disciplined enough for a minimum of one week or two, then they are ready. I told you the story before about a non-Muslim lady that was coming to visit the masjid. And I met her in the lobby with a daughter of about four years old, between three and four years old. And the daughter is walking on her toes. So I approached them, how can I help you? She said, no, I'm coming to visit. I said, welcome. And I looked at the little girl and I said, why are you walking on your toes? Listen, the girl looked at her mom and pointed with his, her finger. She said, because mommy told me that this is unlike any other place that I can run or do anything as I do anywhere. So her translation of her mom's instruction was to walk on her toes. This is not a girl who has learned the Quran. This is not a girl who has prayed ever. This is not a girl whose aqiqah was made in the masjid. This is a non-Muslim young girl that learned discipline. When her mom tells her, this is unlike any other place, you have to walk nicely, you have to be quiet, you don't run. She translated it into the utmost respect she could express as a young girl. Our boys and girls need to learn this even by the age of 10 and 12 and 13 and 15 and 19. Why? Because in all of these ages, they think of themselves as ignorant young children whose behavior is going to be tolerated no matter what. Worse yet, some parents bring their children to the masjid or send them with their siblings and say, you don't want to make noise here at home. Go to the masjid and play with your friends over there. So when we want to raise what we call a great Muslim generation, these are the things we need to pay attention to. And I'm talking about the basics of the basics. I'm talking about the basics of the basic. And we need to teach our children, what is this masjid made for? This masjid is not a social club. Even it has to accommodate social activities for kids. But primarily, this masjid is the house of Allah. So I want you, when you see any child running in the masjid, raising their voices in the masjid, or even fighting in the masjid, to remind them, ask them, whose house is this? Just ask this question, and you will be surprised. Theoretically, they know that this is the house of Allah, but practically, they don't know the adab, the etiquette, and how to behave oneself in the house of Allah SWT. Then ask them the second question, do you do this in your own home? And most of them, they don't. So who is the disciplinarian in the house of Allah? 
if it is not the parent, if it is not the community, if it is not me and you, then who is going to tell them? So for them to become a great generation, the basics must be considered first. These are the priorities. To connect them to the Quran, to sit down with them and teach them the Quran, to recite the Quran with them. And by the way, doing this, don't you think that you're doing something strange? The Prophet Sallallahu assignment that came from Allah, Allah says, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ To recite the ayat of Allah unto them. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And to purify them, to train them, to educate them, and to purify their souls, so that their choices are good choices. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ as the Prophet ﷺ is charged with the responsibilities that we know to recite the Qur'an and to us so that we can read it. To teach us the book and the wisdom. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And to purify them. We are charged with the same responsibilities with our own children. No one will come to raise your kids for you. Even if you send them to a full-time Islamic school, the Islamic school is as good as the children that come into it, as good as the parents of the children that are sent into it, as good as the teachers that teach in it. So the three components of the school, and the fourth is definitely the curriculum. What do you offer them of education? But it has to be the four elements working together. You as a parent, working with your child at home, working with the teacher in the school, and your child cooperating with the teachers, and the teachers cooperating with you as a parent, and giving the children the mercy, the compassion, and the knowledge that will give them the empowerment they need to be the great Muslim generation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to do our best and not to do just the minimum. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhin astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu wa ba'd our children think that they can say and do anything, anywhere, anytime. Because unfortunately in the school, what you call adab is not known much in the school. Unless you engage the school with what you regard as good and what you expect and what you don't want your children to learn, the school wouldn't know on their own they will do what the system says. And the system is focused on the material and the book more than the human being in front of the teacher. The human is going to be told, unfortunately, that you are your own God. Not in the same words, but that's the effect of it. That you are a free agent for on your own behalf, and nobody could force you to do what you don't want to do. And if anybody forces you to do anything that you don't like, you know what to do. So our children are not going to be raised as Muslims by the school. Even the Islamic school, the teachers don't have the time to raise a child. Teachers have the time to teach a child a certain set of materials. But they will not follow up on your kid eight hours a day. They will not. So, tarbiyah starts at home. The school may or may not help, augment, reinforce, or fight against what you teach them at home. Then it is at home again when the child comes back that you do the follow up to make sure that what you educate your child is sticking and that he or she are practicing what you tell them. So it's not enough to send them to an Islamic school. 
it's not enough either to bring them a Quran teacher, even on one on one basis. Because a Quran teacher will help them memorize the Quran. Maybe he will correct the way they read it. But again, he is not going to raise your child as a Muslim. He will help you if you work with your child. But don't say, I have a special teacher, he goes to an Islamic school, he memorizes part of the Quran or two, uh, he prays when I tell him to pray. Only rest when they are doing all of the above on their own. When they are following the guidance of the Quran on their own. When they start showing serious signs that they love the Quran, they appreciate the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they want to practice it. This is the point. The Quran is not sent for us to enjoy turning written words into beautiful voices. That's not what the Quran is for. Most of us are looking for the most beautiful voice in recitation. And our children, when they cannot do that, they think they cannot learn the Quran. Because we, the parents, are looking for that as a standard. But the objective of the Quran is لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ So that they may reflect and ponder as they recite the ayat of the Quran. And don't do it by yourself. As you designate time for your Quran, match your time with the children's time, with your wife's time, and make the Quran the family center of learning. The family center of guidance. Let Allah guide your own family, not just yourself. Don't be happy that you come and pray on a regular basis. Be happy when your children want to come with you to pray, not to play. This is key. So we'll stop here for the time and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to learn what is needed and to practice what we learn and to benefit from our learning. Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt Allahumma aqsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna maasiyatik wa min taatika ma tubalighuna bihi jannatak ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا اللهم لا تجعل, اللهم لا تجعل آخرتنا أسوأ من دنيانا اللهم اجعل الحياة زيادة لنا في كل خير واجعل الموت راحة لنا من كل شر واختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاه